the Bahamas. Introduction. Because of its geography, smuggling has been part of the Bahamian economy throughout its history. The Bahamas is a chain of 700 coral islands, of which just 29 are inhabited. The Bahamian archipelago stretches 750 miles, from Cuba and Hispaniola to just 40 miles off the southeast coast of Florida. In the years after World War II, the development of the Bahamian economy focused on tourism, while a group of British businessmen known locally as the Bay Street Boys controlled most aspects of the local economy. The Bay Street Boys represented gambling interests as well as the merchant class. In 1967, a more broadly based Bahamian party, the Progressive Liberals Party, PLP, led by Lyndon Pendling, took power. Within a year of its 1973 independence from Britain, Bahamian law enforcement authorities were warning that drug trafficking was a serious problem, and by 1979, that problem was a crisis. In the late 1970s, both the narcotics smuggling and government corruption in the Bahamas grew at an extraordinary rate. Initially, marijuana was the principal narcotic smuggled through the Bahamas, but cocaine became an increasingly significant factor in the early 1980s. As of 1988, the Bahamas remained a major transit country for both drugs, with 50 to 60 percent of all the cocaine and marijuana entering the U.S. transiting through Bahamian territory. Witness after witness appearing before the subcommittee testified to using one or another Bahamian island to drop drugs for transfer to fast boats or small planes. Luis Kojak Garcia, a former smuggler who gave up this vocation voluntarily to become a DEA informant, testified that by dividing a load of drugs among 10 fast boats coming from the Bahamas, he could limit the risk of interdiction to a fraction of the total load. Customs, he said, would be forced to choose which of the ten boats to intercept. They simply lacked the men and equipment to stop all ten. The witnesses agreed that the U.S. Customs Service and the Coast Guard could not possibly check the thousands of boats and planes traveling regularly between the Bahamas and the United States. While the geography of the Bahamas is ideal for smuggling, and inadequate law enforcement resources assure traffickers of being able to move significant quantities of drugs to the United States, cooperation from Bahamian officials to protect their operations from interference has been essential. Typically, traffickers have bribed local Bahamian customs officials and police and have hired locals to unload and reload drug cargoes. When their operations grew in size, the payoffs demanded from Bahamian officials grew larger and involved higher-ranking members of government. Luis Garcia, a major smuggler of marijuana who became a DEA informant in 1983, testified, quote, I was heavily involved in smuggling drugs into the United States for almost four years, beginning in early 1979. At that time, I supervised an operation which smuggled tons of drugs mainly from Colombia and Jamaica by way of the Bahamas, with complete impunity. That was accomplished by paying for protection to the Bahamian authorities from the lowest-ranking officer to the highest politicians and officers. It is believed that if it was not for this fact, my smuggling activities and those of many others like me would not have been so successful. End quote. Garcia said payoffs were essential. Corruption, he said, began with airport and customs inspectors, but continued to higher-level appointed Bahamian officials. Garcia said he had never paid bribes to Bahamian elected officials. According to Garcia, a typical shipment of 6,000 to 8,000 pounds of marijuana cost $130,000 to $150,000 in bribes to Bahamian officials. Most of that went to police, immigration, and custom officials. Among those bribed were the chief of the Bahamian Drug Task Force, whom Garcia said he had on his payroll, and a former chairman of the PLP, the ruling party in the Bahamas. 
Official payoffs, Garcia estimated, were about 15% of the total cost of a marijuana shipment. In the early 1980s, the bribes ensured the smugglers a sanctuary from U.S. patrols. As Garcia testified, quote, If somebody is chasing you up there 30 miles out in the ocean and you see them coming, you can turn around and head back into the islands. And, of course, you are paying for protection. They are going to protect you. If you pay, you won't get arrested. End quote. Growth of Official Corruption with Vesco and Bannister In 1972, Robert Vesco fled the United States, having been accused by law enforcement authorities of looting $240 million from the Overseas Investors Services Mutual Fund. Upon leaving the U.S., Vesco established operations in the Bahamas, developing a relationship with a political fixer named Everett Bannister, who was close to Prime Minister Pindling. In time, Vesco gave Bannister carte blanche at the Bahamas Commonwealth Bank. Bannister and Pindling, in return, provided Vesco protection from extradition. In part, as a result of his dual relationship with Vesco and Pindling, Bannister became increasingly influential in the Bahamas and became known to many narcotics traffickers as a man who could provide protection to them quote, from the top, end quote. Bannister had left the Bahamas in the 1940s and lived for a number of years in New York before returning as a consultant when the Pendling government came to power in 1967. Bannister then devoted his attention to providing assistance to clients as diverse as Resorts International, one of the Bahamas' principal gambling operations, and to Anastasio Somoza, when he was a fugitive from Nicaragua. In the latter case, Bannister reportedly received $320,000 in cash from Somoza to buy him a safe haven. According to his son, Gorman Bannister, his father said most of the money was paid to the man. Gorman understood that to mean the money went to Prime Minister Pendling. Everett Bannister assisted drug traffickers in a number of ways. He had them removed from the official stop lists, making it possible for traffickers to enter and leave the country without official interference, and warned them of impending drug raids. Use of Norman's K for Smuggling Beyond his influence with high government officials through the involvement in the Bahamas Commonwealth Bank, a second consequence of Robert Vesco's activities in the Bahamas was the arrival of Colombian cocaine traffickers. Vesco had left the Bahamas in 1972 after the bank failed and U.S. pressure to extradite him grew. But he returned in 1978 after establishing a relationship with the Colombian drug dealer Carlos Lader. Lader and Vesco became regular companions on the islands, and Lader decided to use the Bahamas as his base for smuggling cocaine to the United States. In 1978, Lader bought most of Norman's K, one of the Exuma Islands, 50 miles from Nassau. By the end of the year, Norman's K was home to a group of some 40 Lader employees who drove the other residents and itinerant visitors away from the island at gunpoint. Ladair built a large hangar which had cocaine storage facilities inside and was using the island as a transshipment and distribution point for cocaine coming into the United States. Ladair's behavior led a number of U.S. property owners on the island to protest the confiscation of their property to the U.S. Embassy in Nassau. In July 1979, one of the Americans, Professor Richard Novak, delivered records of the drug flights, supported by photographs and movies, to the then-American chargé d'affaires, Andrew Antipas. After meeting with Antipas and the DEA officers stationed in Nassau, Novak returned to the island by small plane, accompanied by his son, to collect his belongings. Without Novak's knowledge, Ladair had learned of his visit to the embassy and his complaints about the cocaine operation. Ladair's associates surrounded the plane when it returned, smashed the radios, drained most of the fuel, 
and then forced Novak and his son to reboard and take off at night. Novak and his son survived the resulting crash. At the end of August 1979, under intense pressure from the U.S. Embassy, a police raid on Norman's K was scheduled. For reasons never fully explained by the Bahamians, it was postponed for 15 days. When the raid finally took place, it was apparent that during the intervening 15 days, Ladair had been warned and the island had been cleaned up. As the police raid began, Ladair managed to destroy what little cocaine was left on the island, and although he was arrested, he was released immediately. The major victim of the raid was a competitor of Ladair's, a smuggler named Ward, who was also using Norman's K. As a result of the raid, Ward was arrested, put on the Bahamian government stop list, and forced to move his smuggling operation to Haiti. Despite two more raids on the island, about which Ladair also received advance warning, the smuggling operation on Norman's K continued without interference, and in fact became even more outrageous. Ladair then began a public campaign against police harassment and U.S. imperialism. During the 1982 celebration of Bahamian independence, Ladair flew his light plane over the Nassau Park where the festivities were taking place and dropped leaflets saying, DEA, go home. Many of the leaflets had $100 bills stapled to them. These leaflets showered on the heads of the Prime Minister and U.S. Chargé d'Affaires Antipas. The subcommittee received testimony from Gorman Bannister that his father, Everett Bannister, was the person who had tipped Ladair off to the impending drug raids. As Bannister testified, quote, Senator Kerry, did your father warn Carlos Ladair of the police raid on Norman's K? Mr. Bannister, yes. Senator Kerry, do you want to describe that? Mr. Bannister, well, as I recall, he just made a phone call to Carlos letting him know, well, police are going to... Senator Kerry, you heard the phone call. Mr. Bannister, oh, yes, 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 yes. I know my father did call him one time and told him, listen, the police are going to raid Norman's K on a certain day, clean it up. And when they went there, they didn't find anything. End quote. When an opposition member of the Bahamian Parliament, Norman Solomon, began to complain to Bahamian and U.S. authorities about the situation involving Ladair's use of Norman's K for narcotics trafficking, his house and car were blown up. According to Gorman Bannister, Ladair boasted to him and to his father that he was behind the bombing because he didn't like Solomon depicting Ladair's Colombian employees in the drug trade as animals. Bannister testified that his father viewed Ladair's decision to bomb Solomon as appropriate. Everett Bannister was indicted in the Southern District of Florida in March 1989 on narcotics charges, following testimony before the grand jury by his son, Gorman. Response by United States to Ladair Problem a subcommittee staff review of the pertinent cable traffic from the embassy during the relevant period shows that the U.S. Embassy continuously protested to the Bahamian government about the Norman's K problem and routinely cabled Washington about the scope of the problem in the early 1980s. These cables led to a 1982 meeting between Vice President Bush, Admiral Daniel Murphy, and Bahamian Prime Minister Pendling at which the Norman's K problem was raised. The vice president chastised the prime minister for what was taking place. During the meeting, Prime Minister Pendling was shown a computer printout of C-5A surveillance of Norman's K and was told that the island resembled O'Hare Airport because of its activity. Despite this confrontation, there was no follow-up by the United States. Instead, with the appointment of a new ambassador... United States-Bahamian relations focused on base rights negotiations, and the drug issue was relegated to a much lower priority. 
the new ambassador, Lev Dobriansky, stated publicly that, in his view, the most important issue in United States-Bahamian relations was the negotiation of base rights for the United States. Law enforcement agencies and prosecutors in South Florida noted the policy shift. These officials were attempting to obtain State Department cooperation for sting operations aimed at Bahamian officials and for their efforts to extradite traffickers from the Bahamas. These actions were met with indifference and, in some cases, hostility from the ambassador. On September 5, 1983, NBC Nightly News exposed the Normans case scandal and directly accused the Bahamian government of complicity in allowing Laidair's operations to continue. The NBC broadcast and the resulting outcry in the Bahamas led to the establishment of a Royal Commission of Inquiry to probe drug trafficking and drug-related corruption in the Bahamas. The inquiry report led to the resignation of two cabinet officials and the prosecution, but later acquittal, of some police officials. The operation on Norman's K came to an end, and Laidair returned to Colombia. None of these events changed the role of the Bahamas as a major transit point for cocaine traffickers or diminished the corruption within the Bahamian government. Subcommittee hearings on the issue and a debate on decertification of the Bahamas for failure fully to cooperate with the United States on drug enforcement issues generated renewed concern, and narcotics again became a major priority of the embassy. Extent of Bahamian Corruption Today The State Department's annual report on international narcotics control details the degree to which corruption remains today an essential element of the Bahamas' status as a major drug transit country. According to the 1988 report, the Bahamas still is experiencing, quote, systematic corruption, which continues to make the Bahamas attractive to drug traffickers, end quote. The report notes that investigations into official corruption appear to be limited to low-level enforcement officers and fail to deal at all with higher-level corruption. Even when corruption is found, suspected law enforcement or military personnel are not normally charged or tried in court for their offenses. Instead, they are merely forced to retire. Other evidence of the continuing problem with official corruption in the Bahamas is the renomination of George Smith and Kendall Nottage for parliamentary seats by the Progressive Liberal Party. Both won their seats despite the fact that they were identified in the 1984 Commission of Inquiry report as being involved in narcotics-related corruption. Nottage was indicted March 29, 1989, by a Boston federal grand jury on narcotics money laundering charges. Although the Bahamian government passed a comprehensive drug law in January 1987, which includes a provision for the, quote, retroactive confiscation of narcotics-derived assets, end quote, no arrests or prosecutions under the new act took place in the year following its enactment. In 1988, only one person, a Bahamian policeman, was convicted under this provision. The March 1989 report stated that, quote, narcotics-related corruption continues to be a problem, making the country attractive to drug traffickers, end quote. Similarly, Extradition of drug traffickers remains a serious problem. The United States has for more than three years sought extradition of Nigel Bowe, a Bahamian lawyer with strong ties to the PLP and the Bahamian government. To date, the Bahamians continue to stall his extradition. The Bahamian response to the U.S. on the Bowe extradition issue has been inadequate at best. Bahamian officials argue that Bo is a rich man and using the best legal talent in the country to delay extradition. What that explanation fails to address is the question of why the Bahamians themselves have not investigated Bo's activities. 
U.S. law enforcement authorities believe Bo has played a key role in organizing smuggling throughout the Caribbean, a matter which should be of some interest to the Bahamian authorities if they are indeed concerned with cooperating with the U.S. in the war on drugs. Nevertheless, the United States has continued to certify the Bahamas as providing full cooperation in fighting the war on drugs. The United States has done so on the ground that the Bahamas has taken adequate steps on its own to control drug production, trafficking, and money laundering. Assistant Secretary of State for Narcotics Matters, Barbara Ann Robleski, testified that the baseline issue in determining whether to certify a country was whether there is, quote, corruption to such an extent that it has gotten in the way of cooperation, end quote. The record developed by the subcommittee, as well as the State Department's own International Narcotics Control Strategy Report, document that corruption in the Bahamas continues to be the major obstacle to cooperation. Bahamas seeks to influence U.S. policymakers. In 1985, the increased public attention to the role of the Bahamas as a base for drug smuggling led that government to seek the advice of a U.S. public relations firm. The firm, Black, Manafort, and Stone, submitted a memorandum to the Bahamian officials suggesting that it could sell the United States government on the importance of the Bahamas to U.S. security. In that memorandum, Black, Manafort, suggested that public attention be focused on the demand side of the drug issue, thus diverting attention from the narcotics-related problems on the islands. The Black Manafort principal assigned to the matter, Matthew Friedman, was a former senior State Department official who had handled narcotics issues. Shortly after the 1984 U.S. election, Black Manafort advised the Bahamian government that, quote, perception by official Washington will frequently drive the realities which will affect policy decisions. In this regard, the government of the Bahamas is operating in a negatively charged atmosphere, end quote. According to Black Manafort, the Department of State and the Department of Defense wished to maintain a solid relationship with the pendling administration, but the DEA and the Department of the Treasury were active critics. According to the memorandum, political critics of the pendling government had been, quote, sowing the seeds that the government of the Bahamas is a nation for sale, inviting drug czars to use the banking system, that government officials are participating in the drug trafficking, that the pendling administration is about to collapse, and much more, end quote. Black Manafort advised the Bahamian government that it needed to lobby both the executive and congressional branches of the United States government beginning with the National Security Council, to mobilize political support for the Bahamas and to focus the Departments of Defense and State so as to, quote, affect Treasury and justice policy, end quote. The memo went on to suggest that the personal relationships between then-Secretary of Defense Weinberger and then-Attorney General Meese could be used to redefine the priorities of the U.S. in its dealings with the Bahamas. Black Manafort was to charge the Bahamas $800,000 per year for representing them on these matters, and the firm was ultimately retained by the Bahamian government. In addition, a former coordinator of the South Florida Drug Task Force, Admiral Daniel Murphy, who participated in the previously mentioned 1982 meeting with Prime Minister Pendling, testified that he solicited the Bahamas as a client for his consulting firm, Gray & Company. He was unsuccessful. The role of the U.S. consultants raises troubling questions about conflict of interest. Narcotics issues are indeed national security issues. The subcommittee believes it is not in the interest of the United States to have former government officials, whether from the Congress or the executive branch, who held policy positions dealing with narcotics law enforcement, to use the knowledge they have obtained to work for a foreign government whose officials are implicated, either directly or indirectly, in the drug trade. Bahamian Cooperation 
Shortly after the Bahamian government retained U.S. public relations consultants, it suddenly began cooperating on some drug issues on the advice of its consultants. For instance, the government allowed the installation of an aerostat radar, set up joint air and naval operations, and allowed U.S. authorities to enter Bahamian territory in hot pursuit of drug traffickers. Yet, the cooperation remained far from complete. For example, the government continued to allow foreign nationals arrested for drug smuggling to leave the country after bail, and continued to make it difficult for U.S. authorities to participate in the destruction of seized drugs. The Bahamian willingness to cooperate with interdiction efforts has created a pro-Bahamian constituency in interdiction-related agencies such as the Customs Service. But the increased level of interdiction cooperation has neither cut the amount of cocaine coming into the United States from the Bahamas, nor has it led to the destruction of the major smuggling organizations. Indeed, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-U.S. Affairs Richard Hallwell noted, quote, Notwithstanding the cooperation, there has been an increase in trafficking, end quote. The Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics Matters and the Administrator of the DEA acknowledged that the Bahamas remains a significant transshipment point. Conclusions The case of the Bahamas illustrates many of the failings of United States foreign policy as it relates to narcotics. One, policy was made at the embassy level with little apparent interagency coordination. When ambassadors changed, and U.S. anti-drug efforts in connection with the Bahamas diminished, the decreased attention to the problem went largely unnoticed in Washington. 2. There was not any coordinated follow-up to strong initiatives. The vice president's meeting with Prime Minister Pendling was followed by a four-year hiatus before significant pressure was exerted on the Bahamian government relative to the drug issue. 3. The administration did not regard the embassy in the Bahamas as an important post because of the country's location, size, and political system. Mr. George Antipas remained as the charge for more than two years before a new ambassador was appointed. His replacement had little experience in Caribbean affairs and did not exhibit any feeling for the importance of the drug issue. The current ambassador has demonstrated an understanding of the drug issue and has elevated this issue to the top of the U.S.-Bahamian bilateral agenda. 4. There was little or no direct coordination between the U.S. attorneys in Florida and the embassy in Nassau. The lack of coordination led law enforcement officials to believe that there was little point in pursuing cases against Bahamian citizens or government officials because they would get little support from the State Department on extradition or operational matters. Today, some of these factors have changed. The U.S. government appears to have recognized the significance of the threat posed by the continued use of the Bahamas as the most significant transit point for illegal drugs coming into the United States. There are some areas, such as in the arrest and deportation of drug traffickers found smuggling through pre-clearance procedures, in which the Bahamian government is now cooperating with the U.S. Yet the Bahamas continues to be the major transit point for cocaine and marijuana coming into the U.S. Even though laws have been enacted to allow seizure of drug-related assets, no such seizures have taken place. Few, if any, drug traffickers arrested in the Bahamas are convicted and jailed. The result suggests to many that the government of the Bahamas is not sincere, but engaged in a rather cynical exercise to placate the United States. For this reason, one of the most important issues in United States Bahamian drug cooperation is extradition, especially of persons indicted in the United States who have alleged ties to Bahamian government officials. In the past, the U.S. Customs Service has expressed some concern over the granting of pre-clearance privileges to other countries. Customs officials have argued that the United States stands to lose control over the disposition of individuals charged with crimes and arrested in a foreign country 
with which we have such agreements, particularly if there have been historical problems associated with extradition. Customs has expressed the concern that some individuals who otherwise would have been arrested upon reaching the U.S. may escape punishment following an arrest in such a country. The State Department has argued, however, that preclearance can serve the useful purpose of alerting U.S. law enforcement authorities that an individual charged with crimes will be entering the U.S. on a specific date, time, and place. This advance intelligence can be used to ensure that arrests are made once the individual reaches his or her destination in the United States. The pre-clearance agreement with the United States is very important to the Bahamian tourist industry. The subcommittee believes that a thorough review needs to be undertaken regarding this agreement to determine whether, on the whole, it has reduced the flow of narcotics to the United States from the Bahamas or has allowed narcotics traffickers to escape punishment. If the benefits do not outweigh the costs, the U.S. should announce our intent to terminate this agreement within one year unless substantial progress is made in resolving these problems. In addition, the subcommittee believes the president should retain, as an optional sanction, the ability to terminate any nation that has customs preclearance if it is determined the nation does not fully cooperate with the U.S. in the war on drugs. Appendix Denial of Request for Declassification In this chapter, there are five references to news media reports on the Bahamas which are used to document the role of the Bahamas in the narcotics trade. On December 1, 1988, Senator Claiborne Pell, chairman of the Committee on Foreign Relations, wrote the Department of State requesting the declassification of 11 U.S. government documents which corroborate these news accounts. On December 27, 1988, Chairman Pell was notified in writing by the Department of State that the declassification request had been denied. The one document which the State Department did not object to declassifying was a September 5, 1983 transcript found in their files of an NBC nightly news program entitled The Navy and the Bahamas. The subcommittee believes strongly that disclosure of all 11 documents is in the public interest to facilitate public understanding of official responses to the war on drugs. The State Department response of December 27, 1988 and the September 5, 1983 NBC transcript are included as appendices at the end of this section. U.S. Department of State, Washington, D.C., December 27, 1988. Honorable Claiborne Pell, Chairman, Committee on Foreign Relations, U.S. Senate, Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. Chairman, I am replying to the request to the Department of December 1, 1988, that it review for declassification 11 documents which were transmitted at that time. Concurrently, the Department was requested to retrieve an additional document from its files and to review it also for declassification. After careful review and consideration, we find that we have no objection to the declassification and release of document number one. We have no objection to the release in part of documents numbers 7, 10, and 11. Those portions that must be withheld are bracketed in ink. In all cases where material has been excised, the relevant subsections of Executive Order 12356, Section 1.3, a, 3, and 5 are noted in the margin. We believe that despite the passage of time, the premature disclosure of this material would have an adverse effect on sensitive issues in United States relations with the Bahamas. It contains foreign government information provided in confidence and confidential U.S. government assessment and recommendations. Documents numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8 must be withheld in full. Documents numbers 2, 4, 5, 6, and 8 are essentially comprised of sensitive material, the disclosure of which could adversely affect our bilateral relations with the government of the Bahamas. These documents contain foreign government information provided in confidence 
as well as confidential U.S. assessment and recommendations. In addition, document number three, wholly, and documents number five and six concurrently are comprised of deliberative material, which must be withheld under Section B-5 of the Freedom of Information Act, Title V, USC, Section 552, as comprising interagency or intra-agency communications exempt from disclosure under the deliberative process or similar privilege. We believe that the Department of Justice has significant equities in two documents, numbers 9 and 12, which we believe contain sensitive material, the disclosure of which could be injurious to our relations with the Bahamas. As above, these documents contain foreign government information provided in confidence, as well as confidential U.S. government assessment. Therefore, the Department of Justice should be asked to review this material. We have written the relevant subsections of EO 12356, Section 1.3A3 and 5 in the margin adjacent to the sensitive material. I understand that officers of the Department are in direct contact with your staff concerning this review. Alternatively, if you have any further questions, please contact Mr. Frederick Smith, Jr. of our Bureau of Administration on 647-2207. With best wishes, sincerely, J. Edward Fox, Assistant Secretary, Legislative Affairs. Enclosures, Documents Numbers 1 through 12. Memorandum. To Department of Defense. Attention, Miss Helen Young. Program, NBC Nightly News, WRC-TV, NBC Network. Date, September 5, 1983. 7 p.m., Washington, D.C. Subject, The Navy and Bahamas. Tom Brokaw. Robert Vesco is America's most notorious fugitive. For years, law enforcement officials have been trying to nail him on a variety of charges, most of them related to the disappearance of millions of dollars from a company that Vesco controlled. Tonight, in this special segment, Brian Ross describes how Vesco continues to live his life on the lam in luxury, now in the Bahamas, where the Vesco connection is powerful and illegal. Brian Ross For more than four years now, this beautiful, seldom-visited island in the Bahamas, just 200 miles from the Florida coast, has been the base for one of the biggest drug smuggling operations in the world. The island is called Norman's Cay. And here, in the middle of nowhere, a smuggler's dream. Refrigerated hangars store tons and tons of cocaine and a million-dollar paved runway long enough to handle jet planes. This is the man who dreamed the smuggler's dream, the man at the top of the Norman's K smuggling operation, Robert Vesco, the accused Wall Street master swindler who fled the United States ten years ago and is now said to have made millions of dollars in the drug business in the Bahamas since the late 70s, when these pictures were taken. Man. He roams the streets freely, usually with not more than two bodyguards. Ross. This Florida drug agent worked undercover in the Bahamas. Man. Mr. Vesco was involved very heavily in the cocaine traffic. He was a major financier. He provided some of the muscle protection for different groups of smugglers, and that his, the majority of his empire, was being held together by money that he was making from narcotics smuggling. Ross. Federal agents have been following the Vesco drug business for at least two years. This seized freighter is just one of dozens of boats and airplanes that agents say Vesco has used to smuggle cocaine and marijuana into the United States. Authorities say Vesco's Colombian cocaine supplier is this man, Carlos Lader, like Vesco, a fugitive from American justice. But federal authorities say that even with all they know about Vesco's drug business, the ships, his Colombian connection, his island drug bust, even knowing all that, they haven't been able to stop him. Second man. Law-abiding Christians. Crowd reaction. Ross, 
American authorities say Vesco is just too well protected in the Bahamas by some of the leaders of the ruling party, the PLP, the Progressive Liberal Party. A Justice Department intelligence report says a Vesco associate has been, quote, allegedly paying approximately $100,000 per month in Bahamian officials, including Prime Minister, end quote. Mr. Prime Minister, can we talk to you? Prime Minister Lyndon Pendling declined to be interviewed by NBC News about allegations of corruption in his government. In public, as at this rally last week, some of the very Bahamian officials suspected of being involved in drug corruption with Vesco and others speak boldly against drugs. Third man. I say crime and drugs is frustrating our positive image in the country. Ross. This is Kendall Nottage a member of the Bahamian Parliament and a cabinet minister. NBC News has learned that this summer, the FBI was actually making plans to try to arrest Nottage as part of a big federal effort to crack down on the drug business. The plan was like Abscam, to get Nottage on a private yacht just outside Bahamian waters, to get him to take a bribe with hidden cameras rolling. But the plan was blocked at the American Embassy in Nassau. Ambassador Lev E. Dobryansky. I've stopped it. Ross. United States Ambassador Lev Dobryansky says one of the reasons he stopped the FBI investigation was that it might upset delicate negotiations with the Bahamians over a U.S. Navy submarine testing base in the Bahamas. Ambassador Dobryansky. This could be very embarrassing. It could, naturally would be, and it could be very destabilizing. When you look at the total picture, I mean, our relations with the Bahamas is not solely in the drug area. There are many other things which, over the long pull, will be more important than the drug. Ross. Federal authorities say 70% of the cocaine and marijuana coming into this country is coming through the Bahamas. Fourth man. South Florida is not rid of all of it yet. Not as long as we have the Bahamas over there. Ross. Police in Florida are making dozens of drug arrests every day, but the supply of cocaine hasn't gone down, it's gone up. And it's gone up because of the wide open operation of drug bases like this one on Norman's K, run by American fugitive Robert Vesco, said to be protected by Bahamian officials and tolerated by American diplomats more concerned with the Navy bases in the Bahamas than drug bases in the Bahamas. Brian Ross, NBC News, in the Bahamas. This is Our Hidden History.